जी 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 Hi guys. Imagine that another gray gloomy gray gloomy drizzly yuck day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. Let me get this heater turned off. Uh this little dog and I start to wind down our summer in the Finger Lakes of New York. It is now Sunday, October 31st, 2021. We have made it to the end of another month. Been God still waiting for the first frost of the year up here at Bugs in a Jar Farm. Looks like it'll be here in two more days. So, uh, I need to get out and finish planting my daffodil bulbs before Jack Frost gets here. But since it is Sunday, it is time for my doomsday sermon. And um, I don't know. I'm a little torn about this. I was going to include this uh, since I was quoting all these 90-something-year-old uh, hopium addicts yesterday. I was going to include include some uh, quotes from this. This is not an essay. This is actually an interview with Noam Chomsky. Uh, Noam Chomsky, one of my former heroes, and he still is. Old Noam is still one of my heroes. He was actually being a little more of a doomer uh, during the Trump years. Donald Trump really brought out the doomer in... Uh, <laughs> And no, my, uh, but now that Donald is at least back in the shadows for a couple of years, no, not quite the doomer he was uh, a couple of years ago. But uh, we're going just to let Noam again. This is an interview with a doomer uh, who I need to learn more about a fellow uh, named Stan Cox, who I think really is a doomer. Maybe we'll come back next week with an essay by Stan himself. But this is doomer Stan Cox interviewing uh, Noam Chomsky. And this is from Common Dreams, you know, that lefty, that little lefty website, Common Dreams. And they titled this interview, The Path to a Livable Future, or Will Rich Corporations Trash the Planet? Uh, <laughs> I think we all know the question. Uh, will, will rich corporations trash the planet? Rich corporations were trashing the planet. Wasn't it a rich corporation that sent Christopher Columbus... Uh, over here uh, back in 1492. I'm pretty sure it was a rich corporation, you know, in cahoots with the Catholic Church, no doubt, in 1492. Uh, you know, Michael, Miguel Cervantes uh, was talking about you know, alluding to rich corporations trashing the planet when he wrote Don Quixote in 1505, uh, will rich corporations trash the planet? There you go. Anyway, uh, let's find out, does Noam Chomsky believe we are on the path to a livable future, or does Brother Noam think that rich corporations will trash the planet? Um, so Chomsky is now <clears throat> 92 years old, the author of, a, of numerous best-selling political works, blah, blah, blah. His critiques of power and advocacy on behalf of the political agency of the common person have inspired generations of activists and organizers. Okay, but we all know who Gnome is. Let's uh, 
We're going to start off. This is how Stan uh, launched off this interview. Of course, this has been edited somewhat for, you know, to get all the uhs and you knows out. <clears throat> so, uh, of course, we start with the segue of COP26, which is kicking off right at this minute. <clears throat> so Stan uh, asked Noam, most of the nations that will be meeting for the, you know, for COP26 have made emissions reduction pledges. For the most part, those pledges are wildly inadequate. What principles do you think should guide the effort to prevent climate catastrophe? And this is what the 92-year-old gnome has to say. <clears throat> Take it away, gnome. The initiators of the, of the Paris Agreement intended to have a binding treaty, most not voluntary agreements, but there was an impediment. It's called the Republican Party. It was clear that the Republican Party would never accept any binding commitments. The Republican organization, which has lost any pretense of being a normal political party, is almost solely dedicated to the welfare of the super-rich and the corporate sector and cares absolutely nothing about the population of the future of the world. The Republican organization would never have accepted a treaty. In response, the organizers reduced their goal to a voluntary agreement, which has all the difficulties that you mentioned. We have lost six years. Four under the Trump administration, which was openly dedicated to maximizing the use of fossil fuels and dismantling the regulatory apparatus that to some extent had limited their lethal effects. To some extent, these regulations protected sectors of the population from pollution, mostly the poor and people of color. But they are the ones who, of course, face the main burden of pollution. It's the poor people of the world who live in what Trump called, quote, shithole countries that suffer the most. They have contributed the least to the disaster and they suffer the most. Okay, so this is where, uh, guys, and uh, obviously I do, I do not need to say or I should not need to preface this that uh, obviously I think you can d discern which parts of Gnome's uh, rant here or sermon here uh, I agree with and the ones I don't agree with. Okay, this is not my sermon. This is Gnome's just because I am making this apocalyptic, hopium fueled. Uh, Noam Chomsky sermon, my doomsday sermon of the day, does not mean for one minute that I agree with Noam, with Noam Chomsky on one word of any hopium he spouts. This is just, it's just showing, you know, when, when great minds like Noam Chomsky uh, are, are, are still refusing to uh, wake up and smell the coffee as Ann Landers would say. I'm just using this as, as an example of, you, you know, what lefties, uh, the, the lefties are, uh, it, it, anyway, I think I've made my point. All right, getting back to Noma. It doesn't have to be this way. As you write in your new book, he's talking about Stan's new book titled The Path to a Livable Future, there is indeed a path to a livable future. There are ways to have responsible, sane, and racially just policies. It's up to all of us to demand them, something young people around the world are already doing. 
other countries have their own things to answer for, but the United States has one of the worst records in the world. The United States blocked the Paris Agreement before Trump eventually got into office, but it was under Trump's instru instructions that the United States pulled out of the agreement altogether. I don't need to go on my own sermon about that. <clears throat> if you look over at the more sane Democrats, who are far from guiltless, there are people called moderates, like Senator Joe Manchin, the leading recipient of fossil fuel funding, whose position is that of the fossil fuel companies, which is, as he puts it, no elimination, just innovation. That's ExxonMobil's view of it, too. Quote, don't worry, we'll take care of you, they say. We are a soulful corporation. We are investing some futuristic ways to remove from the atmosphere the pollution that we're pouring into it. Everything is fine. Just trust us. Close quote. You know, him paraphrasing the greenwashing of the Exxon Corporation. No elimination, just innovation, which may or may not come, and if it does, it will probably be too late and too limited. Take the IPCC report that just appeared. It was much more dire. There we go. It was much more dire than previous ones and said we must eliminate fossil fuels step by step every year and be free of them completely within a few decades. A few days after that report was released, Joe Biden issued a plea to the OPEC oil cartel to increase oil production which would lower gas prices in the United States and improve his position with the population. There was immediate euphoria in the petroleum journals. There is a lot of profit to be made, <clears throat> but at what expense? It, it was nice to have the human species for a couple of hundred thousand years, but evidently that's long enough why should we break the record? Why organize for a just future for all when we can trash the planet, helping rich corporations get richer? Okay. Then we get back. This is Stan's uh, next question. <clears throat> Ecological catastrophe is closing in on us largely because, as you once put it, quote, the entire socioeconomic system is based on production for profit and a growth imperative that cannot be sustained, close quote. Uh, <clears throat> However, it seems that only state authority can implement the necessary changes in ways that are equitable, fair, and just. Yeah, right. Given the emergency we face, do you think that the U.S. government would be able to justify imposing national resource constraints like rules for resource allocation or fair share rationing, policies that would necessarily limit the freedom of local communities and individuals in their material lives. This is a long way of saying, uh, will the U.S. government uh, uh, make gas prices keep rising? Yeah, right. Back to no. Well, we have to face some realities. <clears throat> I would like to see a move towards a more free and just society, 
production for need rather than production for profit, working people able to control their own lives instead of subordinating themselves to masters for almost their entire waking life, the time required for succeeding at such efforts is simply too great for addressing this crisis. That means we need to solve this within the framework of existing institutions, which can be ameliorated. <clears throat> yes, existing institutions can be ameliorated. We shall see now. The economic system of the last 40 years has been particularly destructive. It has inflicted a major assault on most of the population, resulting in a huge growth in inequality and attacks on democracy and the environment. A livable future is possible. We don't have to live in a system in which the tax rules have been changed so that billionaires pay lower rates than working people. We don't have to live in a form of state capitalism in which the lower 90% of income earners have been robbed of approximately $50 trillion for the benefit of a fraction of the 1%. That is the estimate of the RAND Corporation, a serious underestimate if we look at other devices that have been used. There are ways of reforming the existing system within basically the same framework of institutions. I think they ought to change, but it would have to be over a longer time scale. Well, uh... Which is it? The question is, the question is, according to Noam Chomsky, can we prevent climate catastrophe within the framework of less savage state capitalist institutions? And again, everyone knows my answer to that question, or I would not have a channel called Collapse Chronicles, that this is Noam's answer to his own question. I think there is a reason to believe that we can, and there are very careful, detailed proposals as how to do it, including ones in your new book, as well as the proposals of my friend and co-author, economist Robert Paulin, who has worked many of these things out in great detail. Jeffrey Sachs, another fine economist, using somewhat different models has come to pretty much the same conclusion. These are pretty much along lines of proposals of the International Energy Association, by no means a radical organization, one that grew out of the energy corporations, but they all <clears throat> have essentially the same picture. There is, in fact, even a congressional resolution by AOC and Ed Markey, which outlines proposals that are close to this, and I think it is all within the range of feasibility. Their cost estimates of 2% to 3% of GDP with feasible efforts would not only address the crisis, but would create a more livable future, one without pollution, without traffic jams, and with more constructive, productive work, better jobs, all of this is possible. So obviously it goes without saying that Noam Chomsky, is, Noam Chomsky and AOC run in the same circle. Uh, I assure you AOC is a major fan of Noam Chomsky, and it's no surprise <clears throat> that you will see Noam Chomsky cheering on AOC in uh, <clears throat> his comments. Anyway, 
but uh, now he swings back to reality. But there are serious barriers. How about the serious barriers? The fossil fuel industries, number one, the banks, you know, the banksters behind it all, number two, the fossil fuel industries and the banks that support them. Okay, other than those two biggies, the other major institutions which are designed to maximize profit and not care about anything else. After all, that was the announced slogan of the neoliberal period, the economic guru Milton Friedman's pronouncement that corporations have no responsibility to the public or to the workforce, that their total responsibility is to maximize profit for the few. For public relations reasons, fossil fuel corporations like ExxonMobil often portray themselves as soulful and benevolent, working day and night for the benefit of the common good. It's called greenwashing. There's a few other terms for it other than greenwashing. That is the polite, the most polite term you can call. All right. So, uh, <clears throat> let's talk about some of the methods for saving the planet. So, Stan now asked, uh, no, some of the most widely discussed methods for capturing and removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere would consume vast quantities, quantities of biomass produced on hundreds of millions or billions of acres, therefore threatening ecosystems and food production largely in low-income, low-emissions nations. A group of ethicists and other scholars recently wrote that a core principle... Uh, anyway, guys, his questions are longer than Gnome's answers. This is Gnome's. Uh, okay. Uh, getting down to the question. Uh, two questions. Do you think that the world may be faced with more and more of this sort of exploitation as temperatures rise? And what do you think about these proposals for bioenergy and carbon capture? You know, bioenergy, we're talking biomass, we're talking cutting down forests to save the planet from fossil fuels. Noam Chomsky, this is this is his response to that question. It is totally immoral, but it is standard practice. Where does waste go? It doesn't go in your backyard. It goes to places like Somalia that can't protect themselves. The European Union, for example, has been dumping its atomic waste and other pollution off the coast of Somalia, hammering the fish, harming the fishing areas and local industries. It is horrendous. The latest IPCC report calls for an end <clears throat> to fossil fuels. The hope is that we can avert the worst and reach a sustainable economy within a couple of decades. If we don't do that, we will reach irreversible tipping points and the people most vulnerable will suffer first and most severely from the consequences. People living in the plains of Bangladesh, for example, where powerful cyclones cause extraordinary damage. People living in India, where the temperature can go over 120 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer. Many, many witness parts of the world becoming unlivable. There were recent reports by Israeli geoscientists condemning its government for not taking account of the effect of the policies they are pursuing 
including developing new gas fields in the Mediterranean, they developed an, an analysis that indicated that within a couple of decades over the summer, the Mediterranean would be reaching the heat of a jacuzzi and the low-lying plains would be inundated. People would still live in Jerusalem and Ramallah, but flooding would impact much of the population. Why not change course to prevent this? Okay. Uh, okay, so looking at Stan's next question after his gobbledygook. All right, with these projections talking about the dire UN reports, with these project projections, are economists seeking to gamble away the right of future generations to a decent life? <clears throat> this is Noam's answer to that question. We have no right to gamble with the lives of the people in South Asia, in Africa, or people in vulnerable communities here in the United States. <clears throat> you want to do analyses like that in your academic seminar? Okay, go ahead, but don't dare translate it into policy. Don't dare to do that. There is a striking difference between physicists and economists. Physicists don't say, hey, let's try an experiment that might destroy the world because it would be interesting to see what would happen. But economists do that. On the basis of neoclassical theories, they instituted a major revolution in world affairs in the early 1990s. 80s that took off with Carter and accelerated with Reagan and Thatcher. Given the power of the U.S. compared with the rest of the world, the neoliberal assault, a major experiment in economic theory, had a devastating result. It didn't take a genius to figure that out. Their motto has been, government is the problem. Um, anyway, guys, once again, I see this rant is taking on its own life. Uh, so, okay, well, I guess I'm getting closer. Anyway, of course, let's wrap. I, I'm going to skip over a couple of paragraphs where he's talking about ancient history, you know, from the 1980s where everything went wrong. Anyway, we're going to wrap up with Stan's question. Noam Chomsky, where do you see hope? This is what I was going to read in yesterday's Hopium Roundup, but we're going to wrap up today's sermon with this is where Noam Chomsky sees hope. <clears throat> Young people, there you go, in two words, the old fart sees hope in young people. In September, there was an international climate strike. Hundreds of thousands of young people came out to demand an end to environmental destruction. Greta Thunberg, Greta Thunberg herself, did you see Greta Thunberg getting mobbed at the train station in Glasgow, Scotland? Good Lord, it looked like the Beatles uh, on their first U.S. tour in 1962. The poor girl was almost trampled to death uh, by, by mobs of Greta Thunberg worshippers. Greta Thunberg recently stood up at the Davos meeting of the great and powerful and gave them a sober talk on what they're doing. How dare you, she said. You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. Close quote. You have betrayed us. Those are words that should be seared into everyone's consciousness 
particularly people of my generation who have betrayed them and continue to betray the youth of the world and the countries of the world. We now have a struggle. Do you think so, Noam Chomsky? We now have a struggle. It can be won. The struggle can be won. But the longer it's delayed, the more difficult it will be. If we had come to terms with this 10 years ago, the cost would have been much less. If the U.S. had not been the only country to refuse the Kyoto Protocol, it would have been much easier. Well, the longer we wait, the more we will betray our children and our grandchildren. Those are the choices. I don't have many years. Others of you do. The possibility for a just and sustainable future exists. Yes, the possibility for a just and sustainable future exists, and there is plenty that we can do to get there before it is too late. Anyway, uh, I'm going to give him about a, a half of an amen. Brother Gnome, obviously, uh, overpopulation, never mentioned anywhere in that story. Clearly, uh, he wasn't going to uh, suggest on any level that the one thing that young people can do is not have children. And uh, it's certainly, uh, he's not going to suggest that any sustainable future on this planet will be one with a hell of a lot less than 8 billion humans on it, preferably zero humans. But anyway, that is my sermon, not Noam Chomsky's. All right, did you survive the Noam Chomsky sermon, little dog, you little wiggle worm? So we are, well, I was off to uh, plant some daffodils, but it looks like the rains are returning. Imagine that. Get out there and uh, sustain your future while you still can. Bye, guys. Yes, sir.